our first speaker is going to be Felipe from the um, Community Purchasing Alliance. Felipe. Thank you so much, Kate. Great to be here, everybody. Um, my name is Felipe Wichker. I uh, helped start the Community Purchasing Alliance here in DC about uh, nine years ago. We kind of grew out of a collaboration with the Washington Interfaith Network, a community organizing group that was hearing from churches and schools just how high utilities were um, compared to other operating costs in the wake of the last recession. And I think as we find ourselves another moment of um, economic crisis, uh, it's such an opportunity to kind of think about new ways we can organize ourselves. And that's really what Community Purchasing Alliance is all about. How do we facilitate um, new kinds of relational processes that can help our independent institutions that often make decisions on their own come together to make smarter decisions to maintain our facilities, uh, improve our operations. Um, we started with electricity, doing a group electricity purchase in 2011, and then grew to respond to other needs, janitorial, security, trash hauling. We now have about 75 member owners, including a majority of charter schools in the district, um, many congregations, synagogues. Um, and the main hope is just to kind of come together and lower costs by negotiating together and using our collective market and political leverage to make smarter, more informed decisions and ultimately move the market more towards justice. In 2019, we had about $17 million in transactions that moved to our co-op uh, and went to um, local businesses here in DC. And about uh, 4 million of that went to local black and brown owned businesses. Um, overall, about 57% of our spend went to minority businesses uh, in 10 different programs. So really we see the power of the co-op as a way to respond to all kinds of things. Right now we're in the middle of um, organizing a PPE and mask and face shields and thermometers, those kind of purchases as we think about reopening, how do we make sure we're keeping safe and having what we need. Um, and so the idea with supply shortages, how do we just counteract that by working together as a group and negotiating um, prices with suppliers that might um, uh, be more helpful to us. One story I'll share, um, Travion Smith, he had a small security company. He um, came to our uh, co-op largely due to a relationship he had with the school, Thurgood Marshall Academy was, and he'd been calling the chief operating officer there every day saying, I'd love to provide security for your school. He went to a basketball game there, realized they didn't have the guards. And um, the guy was like, Felipe, could you take <laughs> this call from Travion? He really wants to work for us. And I was like, sure, happy to talk to him. And it turned out that three other schools were just looking to change security vendors. They weren't happy. Um, and uh, I referred uh, Travion after talking to this group RFP process we had for those three schools. It turned out one of them selected him. Uh, he was really good at de-escalation. Um, you know, two years later, he uh, took on a couple more contracts at charter schools. And now fast forward to today, he has a contract at Howard University and several other large um, organizations, more than 104 full-time staff. Um, so we see how the power of the cooperative is a good reference, getting in the door somewhere, somebody else saying a good story about somebody, and that's how we've been able to help many small businesses in the district grow their portfolios to, to serve more. So in some ways we see ourselves as institution. We're not, you know, spending dollars together, we're spending you know tens of millions. And through that process, we can help a lot of small business get access to a ten thousand dollar contract and a hundred thousand dollar contract, and from there um, you know, grow um, the wealth for all. So I'll pause there and um, Kate, I don't know if you want to draw out a few more pieces of the co-op that you know. Yeah, no, I, I would be excited to do so. Felipe, I know that, that we had talked um, a bit prior to the session, really on the, on the aspect that this came out of the last recession and, and what does that really mean as we think about the current economic state and you know, what, is, what is the benefit for someone who wants to be, get involved with bulk purchasing, whether it is yours or you know, to create their own? What, what does that really mean for those entities? Yeah, let's dive into a tangible example. So one of our charter schools was showing us pricing from a couple large vendors that they work with for supplies. Um, they had shown a price for a no contact thermometer at $78 uh, per device. Um, they had a price for mask that was about 10 cents per disposable mask. We were able to get pricing at 57 cents per mask, um, about $45 per thermometer, um, just because we were buying tens of thousands of each, and not just the few hundred they needed for their needs. So. It's simply being able to aggregate their demand from that one school with 10 or 15 other schools. We happen to be working with a couple of universities on a similar purchase. And so we had the pricing already ready to go for a larger volume. And we aggregated them with a few cafes and coffee shops um, in Columbia Heights and was able to get a better pricing there. But the bigger picture is we're asking people to join um, something that they own. Um, and it's not often that you have uh, an entity where the customers are also the owners. Purchasing cooperative allows for incentives. Um, usually, you know, as a, as a service provider, you have interest to kind of 
you know, charge, you know, something that makes sense for us, any, any margin we charge above goes back to our member owners pro rata based on their purchasing. So the largest member purchased about 10% of the overall volume through our co-op. And so at the end of the year, we had about a million dollars in revenue um, this past year. We had $100,000 left over. 10% of that um, goes back as a dividend back to that owner. So because they're an owner, there's a virtuous cycle of putting more of their volume through a co-op like this, and um, they get the rebates at the end of the year as well. So I know you mentioned working with some small cafes and, and coffee shops. Um, is there an opportunity for more businesses who might be interested in working with the purchasing um, association to work with you now? Of course, we're always looking for, for new participants, new members. Um, the basic process is just to reach out when you have a contract you're dissatisfied with. And our specialty really is the facility contract. So things like trash hauling. We have so two, uh, we have two really strong local, locally owned preferred vendors that are DC based. Um, janitorial, security, um, HVAC systems. We're doing a lot right now um, for air conditioning and cooling. Since buildings are closed, a great time to think about deferred maintenance on those systems. Um, if you're thinking about solar, we've developed more than 37 solar projects across properties in DC. Um, anything you're dissatisfied or looking for a change, we might have a better provider for you or some insight to provide you that might be helpful to renegotiate with your current provider. And we're happy to share that insight. We have regular meetings um, with whether it's school operations directors or houses of worship operations directors or small businesses, um, simply reach out to us, cpa.coop, um, send us something you're interested in and we'll kind of follow up with what we may be able to offer. We're here to help. And so we're here just to kind of draw into processes that we have going on and we basically routinely do different things. Like just on Tuesday, we 87 organizations renegotiate um, their utility contracts, third party electric supply, the part of your Pepco bill that comes from the power plants. And effectively those organizations locked in a rate for the next two to three years that we expect to be about seven to 8% below what they would have otherwise paid. And so that savings will amount to several hundred thousand dollars for those organizations over the upcoming couple of years. So that's our goal is just to help out um, in anything we can. And you participate first in the co-op, no obligation for membership. We expect you'll then find value and then wanna invest and become a member owner. And that investment schedule, you put in an equity amount between 500 and 15,000, depending on your annual operating budget. So if you're about a million dollar organization, you usually have a $2,000 equity investment in the co-op, and then your dividends accrue over the years, but no one's obligated to join. You can participate without being a member. Thank you for that. I have one more question and, and then we'll move to Todd, but you know, we talked about how businesses can join to um, be able to take, take part of those cost savings, but you also made reference to how you work with local businesses who are providing services or products. If someone's interested in that angle of working with you, how would that, how would that work? Yeah, great point. Um, so in addition to the like 75 member owners and the 160 participating organizations, we have 35 preferred vendors. And those are people that provide the services, whether it's janitorial or trash or IT or some other kind of consulting service that may be of value to our members. Um, reach out through our websites. We have a little vendor area where we ask you just to kind of submit your kind of pro forma. We usually reach out um, through our members. So whenever we have a need, let's say, um, a lot of schools are buying kind of Wi-Fi devices right now to send home with students um, to be able to better connect the internet. So we're doing a purchase right now for laptops and Wi-Fi devices, hotspots. And we'll ask our members, who have you sourced from well in the past? And if we could find a local provider for those kind of services, we would definitely go to them first and make sure we get to know them and you know help them be successful as part of our solicitation. So reach out to us. We look forward to working with you. Fantastic for that overview. Um, we will come back with more questions in the Q&A. And if you have questions, um, please feel free to keep putting them in the chat and, and we'll come back to those at, at that section. Um, but I'd like to transition to Todd Leverett from the Democracy at Work Institute. And, and Todd, if you could talk a little bit about um, just sort of the, the co-op work that you do overall, but also some of the, the national level resources that you know are available as people are developing co-ops, building up co-ops, sharing co-op resources amongst each other. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kate, and the team over at DSLBD. Um, and thank you to everybody on the call today. Um, quick intro, super excited to be here today. Um, as Kate was saying, my name is Todd Leverett. I'm a member of the team at the Democracy at Work Institute. And the, the mission and the goal of the Democracy at Work Institute, which is a, a national 501c3, is to utilize the power of employee ownership as a tool for racial equity, social equity, and economic equity. Um, Felipe was talking um, you from, to you from the perspective of the, the uh, purchasing co-op world. We come specifically from the worker co-op world, um, and that's our passion, our work, and our, our responsibility. Um, my role specifically, I serve as the program manager for legacy business initiatives, and our legacy business initiatives are focused on engaging all ecosystem stakeholders, including business owners, 
business brokers, investment banks, capital providers, CDFIs, technical assistance providers, um, engaging all these ecosystem actors um, to do really cool transactions in which closely held privately owned businesses are converted from um, privately held over to employee owned. And we look to do those conversions um, mainly in uh, communities of color and immigrant communities. So looking at workforces that are uh, people of color and immigrant workforces and seeing if we can make those workforces the owners of the business where they where they work at. Um, and this legacy business initiative is one of, of several projects um, and programs that Dowie runs um, that go, as Kate mentioned, all the way from early stage startup co-op development all the way to uh, converting existing businesses over to uh, democratic workplaces and co-ops. Um, so, so happy to be here, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of those uh, uh, those programs in the short amount of time that, that we have here. Um, quick overview of some things I, I want to touch on, referring back to what Kate was saying. I, I want to talk briefly about the importance and the need for employee ownership um, in the co-op form, in the democratic employee ownership trust form, democratic ESOP for, form, with the, and I want to talk about the, the need with a focus on conversion. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the ecosystem of support for those who either want to do a startup co-op or who want to convert their existing business into an employee-owned one, or if you're a worker, to convert the, the business that you work at into an employee-owned one. Um, and I want to talk about specifically some of the programmatic work going on within our organization with um, three of our very special partners, uh, the City of Washington, D.C., Kate and the team over at DSLBD and the, and the C program. Um, Felipe and the team over at CPA and the team over at Wake If with, uh, with Jen over there. So don't have a lot of time, but I'll touch briefly on those. Um, so kind of going into the, the reason and the purpose behind all the work, there are several very large trends that are happening in the U.S. economy. Some are very apparent in front of our face right now. Some aren't as well known. But these trends are the trends that make, um, that, that create the reason for why we do the work that we do at the Democracy at Work Institute. Um, generally and specifically within the, the program that I run, the Legacy Business Initiative. Um, the first trend I want to talk about are, are the fact that baby boomers, so your, your generation born post-World War II, owns over almost half of all the businesses in the United States. Um, and why that's important is that, as you may have heard, baby boomers are retiring at very, very rapid rates from their employment, but baby boomers who own businesses are also looking to, to retire themselves. And if you're a business owner, the only way you're able to retire or move on to the next step is to sell your business. So basically what's happening is you're going to have a lot of over $10 trillion in business assets that are going to be entering the marketplace over the next 15 years. And, that, and that's very important. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about is the fact that small businesses provide for over half of all private sector employment um, and payroll. And, and are a huge, very important part of our economy as the current crisis is, is showing us for those who have forgotten that small businesses are important to, to keeping this country going. And then I want to talk about uh, minority-owned firms, which make up over 4 million businesses in the U.S. Um, and these businesses provide multiple layers of, you know, financial benefit, tax base, employment, and cultural value to communities in which they are based and to the workers that they serve. Um, and the fact that over, you know, the, the, the period of time following the recession, minority-owned businesses have led um, most of the metrics when you look at startup creation, growth in businesses, and all these other really important metrics um, that, that we look at in the business economy, they have been led by minority-owned firms. So baby boomers, small businesses, minority-owned firms. And then the trend that, that breaks my heart the, the most um, and is the real emphasis to our work is the racial wealth gap. Um, which is basically the fact that the average white family in the United States has um, 11 times and 13 times the wealth of the average Latinx and black family, respectively. So 11 times the, the wealth of the average Latinx family, 13 times the wealth of the average um, black family. And as you all, I'm sure a lot of you know, a lot of that has to do with, you know, real estate and, and owning your own home. But a large portion of that has to do with ownership and, and being able to hold actual business assets, which, again, the, the importance of entrepreneurship um, in wealth building in this country is, is, is well known. Um, and the final trend we all know about is the COVID trend, which is why we're – one of the reasons we're communicating the way we're communicating here today, and the fact that COVID is 
pushing more and more baby boomer business owners and non-baby boomer business owners, uh, let's say that five times fast, uh, to exit their businesses is threatening the small business ecosystem and is threatening um, specifically minority communities and um, on, on all levels, but also those minority-owned firms and firms that employ minority workers within those communities. So COVID is, is making our work um, all that much more important, not just our work, but the work of uh, CPA, the work of WACUS, and the work of the team over at DSLDD. I know we're all diligently working to, to deal with that. So, okay, so quickly, a long intro, talking a, a little bit, as Kate referred to, to the ecosystem of support that exists out there for those who want to either do a startup um, co-op or who want to convert existing businesses into employee-owned ones. Again, my world is more on the conversion side. Um, but the resources at, you know, Dow, you go to institute.coop, and that'll take you, you know, just about everywhere in our world of, of employee ownership. But I want to talk about workers to owners uh, specifically. And so workers to owners is a collaborative um, that was first convened by Dowie back in 2016, and it contains players from all across the nation, uh, specifically lurking, looking at um, employee ownership conversion. So this includes the developers, the TA providers, the capital providers, and some of these organizations have been in this employee ownership space for more than 20 years, some for more than 30 years, uh, while other ones are new to the space. And what all the members have in, prob uh, in common is that they're actively engaged in working with one or more business conversions, and they are united in utilizing conversions to strengthen and increase equity in communities of color, low-income communities, and rural communities. Um, uh, so what kind of things does the collaborative do? One thing they provide, we provide support for one another when we're doing deal work, fundraising, and establishing new partnerships. There's a lot of institutional knowledge in the collaborative, um, a lot of knowledge learned as, as the, the environment changes. And so we all come together on a regular basis and share that learning and help one another with specifically conversion transactions that we're trying to, we're trying to complete. Um, on our, and we do this on our monthly deal support calls. So if you're part of an organization or you're looking to do a conversion and you need some help figuring out the process, Workers to Owners is Collaborative is one place that you can come and, and get a lot of positive information. Um, talking about another program we have, we have the SEED program. And our SEED program, which the City of Washington, D.C., and Kate and the team uh, at DSLBD and other areas of D.C. government participate, helps to bring municipal actors and players together leaders in government together to figure out how employee ownership can become a part of their economic development plan, a part of their equity plan, and a part of their plans to, to improve their, their city. Um, and uh, CE program is a very, very intense program, very intense program, I'm sure Kate can tell you. And it's a partnership that we do with the National League of Cities. Um, and, uh, you know, at some point in time, I'm sure you will hear from Kate and team about some of the work that their seed team is doing specifically looking around employee ownership. Um, they're specifically looking at um, uh, Ward 7 and 8, uh, or 5, 7, and 8 in Washington, D.C. Um, again, I already spoke about the Legacy Business Initiative. I want to talk very quickly about the relationship with the Legacy Business Initiative and Felipe and CPA on the call. Um, one great thing that CPA does, and Felipe talked about, they bring together great businesses owned by and employing people of color. And one thing we've been able to do within our partnership is help the businesses that CPA represents and supports um, within the, their purchasing co-op to explore employee ownership conversions as an option. And we had some really fruitful conversations with some of CPA's entrepreneurs and owners. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to at some point, one of those businesses becoming employee owned. Um, and finally, I wanna talk about the Access to Capital Program, which is something that we're working with, uh, with Jen and the team over at WACIF, and this is a program that directly deals with the COVID crisis and looks to provide some type of financing, um, uh, bridge financing to allow for businesses to be able to get through this current period um, in the COVID crisis, and at the end of the crisis, um, enable them to convert some or all of their business over to employee ownership. So it connects present-day business survival in COVID with long-term wealth creation for workers uh, of color, immigrant workers, low-income workers using um, uh, employee ownership conversion. So that was a lot. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a breath now, and I'm going to allow Kate to, to go ahead and, and, and pass it on. But look, look forward to hearing from you all soon. 
Todd, I'm going to ask you one quick question as we get ready to, to pass it over to Jennifer. Um, you know, sometimes discussions of co-ops don't seem very tangible. Would you be able to just give us a, a tangible example of a worker conversion um, to just see what it would look like? And, and you know, in brief, we might go into that more later, and then and then we'll turn it over to Jennifer. Oh man, what? Well, uh... I would almost say just choose a choose an industry, <laughs> just choose an industry, and, we, and we'll talk about it. One of one of my favorite uh, conversion stories um, comes out of Chicago, out of Chicago, Illinois, um, and it was a, a window. It's, it's a company many of you probably heard of called New Era Windows, and I think it's particularly pertinent pertinent in this moment. But basically, the the background story behind New Era Windows is that it was a, it was a window they made aftermarket windows so if you're a contractor and you're looking for windows for a project or a job you would, you would go here and, and purchase these aftermarket windows um and what happened is at some point in time the owners of the company decided that they were going to shut down um, and there were some conversations over whether the business actually needed to shut down or whether it was just to the financial benefits of the owner to shut down and we won't go into all that here, but the, the owners eventually did shut down, um, shut down new, uh, the business that wasn't called New Era Windows at the time. Well, what happened was the team or the, or the workers at New Era Windows working with one of our close partners, um, an organization known as The Working World, decided that they wanted to uh, purchase, acquire the assets of their company that had shut down and reopen as um, New Era Windows. So working with The Working World and, and other organizations they were able to purchase the assets um, uh, from the former owners that, that had shut down the company, and they were able to reopen the company as New Era, and they are now a you know, full-fledged worker on co-op, and they have actually uh, grown the business since reopening the business as New Era Window. So um, one of my favorite stories of just you know, kind of a phoenix story of rising out of the dust, using employee ownership, and making something great happen. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And, and we're going to shift things over to, to Jennifer Bryant. And I will just say, as we introduce Jennifer, um, you know, when I first started my work at DSLBD, I met Jennifer and she said, cooperatives are important. How do we get cooperatives on the agenda? And I have watched her work um, for the last several years on, on continuing that. And she's been doing a lot of great stuff at WAKEF. And so she's going to tell us about, about that. But she is also our community fellow for the SEED Fellowship that uh, Todd had made reference to. Thanks, Kate, um, for that great introduction. And thank you for all the work that you've done to support cooperatives over the years and also to really make the case for cooperatives within government. Um, I wanted to start just by giving a quick overview about WAKEF. So we are a DC-based, regionally focused community development financial institution. And since 1987, we provided direct technical assistance and loans totaling more than $34 million in direct investment. The four core areas of our work are small business financing, advising and technical assistance, workshops and training, and signature initiatives. So some of our signature initiatives in include the Ascend Accelerator Program for growth stage businesses, the J.P. Morgan Chase Entrepreneurs of Color Fund, the Minnesota Avenue Main Streets Program, which we lead, and the DC Employee Ownership Initiative. So I'm the Program Manager for Community Wealth Building Initiatives at WAKEF, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the DC Employee Ownership Initiative. Um, Todd mentioned an ecosystem of support, and so I wanna give an overview of the local ecosystem of support and for businesses that are interested in starting a cooperative or converting an existing business to employee ownership. So with the DC Employee Ownership Initiative, we launched it um, in 2018 uh, with support from city community development to preserve legacy businesses and create new pathways to entrepreneurship. So our kind of two main focuses with our conversion work, as Todd mentioned, are to convert legacy businesses to employee ownership and provide exit planning support to retiring business owners but also in the wake of COVID-19 to preserve businesses at risk of closure um, due to this crisis. And beyond that, we really want to help um, shape the narrative around recovery because there are some really interesting opportunities in, in this moment for us to build a, an economy that's more equitable, uh, rooted in shared ownership and um, you know, shared benefit. And so that's what we really wanna push for. In terms of technical assistance and training, 
we do workshops on exit planning and employee ownership. And so I think that, you know, in our local ecosystem in DC, there's a lot of resources about how to start a business, but not a lot of resources about how to exit one. So we've been doing those workshops as an entry point to talk to business owners um, and introduce the concept of employee ownership. We also do one on one conversion technical assistance because we noticed that that was something that was missing locally. Um, that there's a lots of places where you can learn about employee ownership, but if you actually want to do it, um, then um, we wanted to stand in the gap and provide that service through, in partnership with some national organizations, including DAWI and the ICA group. I, my computer is about to die, so I'm just going to plug it in really quickly. <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, Jennifer is to plug in her computer. Um, for those of you who joined late, this is the DC Cooperatives discussion by DSLBD. We're hearing from Jennifer Bryant from WAKEF. If you do have questions and, and you are on the video, you can go ahead and put those questions into the chat. Um, so we'll be doing some questions. Some of those have been, <laughs> been getting answered. Um, if you are on the phone and have some questions and aren't able to get to them today, you can contact us at the, the email address associated with signing up for this and we'll help get those questions answered. All right, Jennifer, back to you. Thank you for that smooth transition. Um, so another thing that we um, do is DC Co-op Day. So in 2019, we did DC Co-op Day at the ARC in Ward 8, had over 75 people come out. We had workshops on all sectors of the local cooperative economy, from housing cooperatives to worker-owned cooperatives, food cooperatives, et cetera. And so we really wanted to create space to bring together folks that are interested in the cooperative model with those who are actually um, in members of cooperatives for knowledge sharing and learning. Uh, we also did one-on-one uh, -on -one technical assistance with um, legal um, advisors, et cetera. And then later this year, in the wake of COVID-19, we're gonna be doing a 2020 cooperative webinar series. And so that's gonna be on topics ranging from you know, how do you do accounting for a cooperative? How do you do, how do you implement profit sharing for a cooperative, collective governance? So those sorts of topics. And if you're interested in that webinar series, which will begin in July, um, you can, you know, sign up for our monthly e-newsletter and we're gonna be sending out um, a blast. And I will share my contact information as well. Um, and, you know, because we're a CDFI, a financial institution, we also want to look at how we can increase capital access to cooperatives locally. And so this year we partner with Capital Impact Partners and City Community Development to do the DC Co-op Impact Grant, which is a $40,000 grant program to support early stage cooperatives. Um, and, you know, we provide loan capital primarily at WAKEF, but there really is um, a need for pre-startup capital for um, all businesses, but cooperative businesses especially, um, because there's a long runway to kind of put the pieces in place to get a cooperative off the ground. And so the, the co-op impact grant is um, a part of that stop gap to help people get to the point where they can access um, capital in the early stages of their cooperative business. So we're gonna be giving out seven grants totaling $40,000, and we're gonna be announcing the recipients of those grants um, next week. Um, we have a great mix of cooperatives that are receiving that funding, most of them led by people of color, many in the food space, um, and some in other sectors locally. And as Todd mentioned, we're working with um, A&H and DAWI to develop uh, the Employee Ownership Access to Capital Program, which would be, as he mentioned, a bridge product um, to help you know, acquire businesses and convert them to employee ownership. So we're really excited for that to develop. And lastly, our local ecosystem. So I actually came to know Kate through the DC Cooperative Stakeholders Group, which she helped to establish um, through DSLBD. And it's been a really great space. We meet monthly um, for folks in the cooperative, local cooperative community, both members, people that want to start cooperatives to come together. Um, it's been um, a great place to network and a lot of new initiatives have emerged out of that space. Um, so we have different working groups. One working group is policy. So we're looking at how can we create policies that will um, make things easier for cooperative businesses to grow, to start, grow and thrive in DC. Um, and 
just briefly, DC has a really rich and long history of cooperative economics. And we saw in a similar moment of crisis in the 1970s that housing cooperatives really exploded and they exploded out of community uh, activism and policy change. And so I think that in this moment, there are a lot of opportunities to think about how can we shift policy to make, um, to make it easier for cooperative businesses to start and grow. Uh, there are a lot of legal resources for people that want to start cooperative businesses in DC, the community development law clinics at UDC and um, GW are two great resources and they provide pro bono legal assistance to cooperative businesses, both worker owned cooperatives, housing cooperatives and other cooperative models. And um, other members of the co cooperative stakeholders group include the beloved community incubator. They incubate um, cooperatives in the Latinx community um, and they work a lot with immigrant communities. They recently started um, a cleaning cooperative last year that's really doing well. Um, and you can check out their website. Um, they're called the Beloved Community Incubator. So I'll just end there, but um, I try, you know, at Wake If we try to be a resource for folks um, around, you know, cooperative business and, you know, being a connector to different resources that can help your cooperative grow. So feel free to contact me, um, come to our webinar series as, that'll be starting in July. Um, and Kate will send out our contact information afterwards, um, and I'll also post my contact information in the chat box. Fantastic, and, and thank you to all three of our speakers. Um, I know that a lot of people have been asking questions, and, and some of those questions have been answered. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with just the, the first one because I think it's a, a quick answer. Um, Jennifer, can anyone join the Cooperative Stakeholders Group? That's a great question. And yes, anyone can join the cooperative stakeholders group. It's open to everyone. We have monthly meetings. Um, our last meeting was a, um, online and it was a space where we could talk about, um, you know, how we could support cooperatives and how the cooperative community can respond in the wake of COVID-19. And so um, if you go to the website for the cooperative stakeholders group, you can get on the email list and um, find out about upcoming meetings. One of the things that we will be doing is we are preparing a slide deck that, that we don't have here today, but we will be including resources and information um, and sending that out to everyone who is registered for the event. And so we'll also be able to share links through that as well. Um, I, I know there's one question I'm going to want to get to talking about ag cooperatives, but I want to start with one question that we found as we've done cooperative trainings can be very helpful. Um, would one of our speakers be able to chime in and just say, what is a cooperative? You had to define it simply. Here, I'll jump in. In, in short, a cooperative is a form of business organization, a form of business government, which instills within its principles um, ideas of uh, internal cooperation within the business, cooperation outside of the businesses with, with other um, co-ops and with the community um, and instills um, principles of dem democracy within the business. So sometimes you may hear the term one worker, one vote in a cooperative. Um, all the workers are empowered with a vote and they can decide on what issues that, that they'll vote on. But it's, it's taking the democracy that, that we uplift so much in, in America and it, it really puts it into a business form. Yeah. And in, and in this process, the, there's uh, profit sharing and wealth sharing amongst the workers as well. Uh, one of the other questions that we get a lot is, is are cooperatives really viable? I mean, you know, is it, is it really a, a serious business structure? Are they, are they really viable? I'll take that one. I think, um, absolutely. I think it just takes imagination and creativity. I think one of the key challenges that the co-op movement has is that um, under like a traditional business structure, there's kind of one single owner, right? And that person gets benefit from it or multiple owners. But uh, in this case, the members are the owners. So it takes that democracy Todd was talking about, it takes that collaboration. But I think in this moment, we realize there are tools for facilitating collaboration in unprecedented ways. And I think I'm so excited with the co-op movement. I think it's one of the most viable business models, given that we know we have to organize together. I was part of a movement to see if we could buy Twitter. What if all the users of Twitter were to buy and become a public utility, right? The Associated Press is a great example of a cooperative. Ace Hardware is a cooperative, all the independent hardware stores. There's so many powerful examples of co-ops and 
in the independent business world, purchasing co-ops like Ace Hardware, we're able to help small business owners compete against Lowe's and Home Depot and the big box store. So the co-op actually has a tremendous advantage if people can understand it. I think we have been not as good in this country about co-ops. I think in Japan and um, in Spain, other countries, there have been um, cultures uh, over the years. Like in Italy, they've had you know generations of policies at the government level that has created an environment. We haven't had that in the US. I think this moment is giving that opportunity. And so I think the, the question the opportunity before us is to imagine how all of our businesses could become co-op business and it's a much more viable business model. And I think it takes all of us seeking the common good together through business to make it work. And, and, and Felipe, I wanna, I wanna add a little, if you don't mind, I wanna add a little bit of, of nuance for folks. So, so there are different types of, of co-ops all centered around these concepts of sharing and growth and wealth and, and in democratic governance. Um, Felipe, uh, CPA specifically would define themselves, even though they, they, they exist all over the cooperative world, um, as a purchasing co-op. So the, the individuals who are buying particular products or services coming together and unifying to, to have more purchasing power in the market. I work more in the world, I work completely in the world of worker co-ops, which are the people who work at business enterprises and who contribute the labor to the business actually being the owners of the business. There are also um, uh, producer co-ops. So a lot of your agricultural, um, large agricultural um, entities are actually a lot of small farmers that have come together to, pro to produce the same goods and go out to market as, um, as a more powerful force. Um, but again, all centered on these ideas of shared risk-taking, shared growth, shared benefit and, and democratic purposes. Oh, and side note, the largest, the largest um, cooperative uh, co-op company in the U.S. has over 2,000 employees, and that's Cooperative Home Care Associates in New York City. Um, so feel free to look that up. Yes. I had one more form of cooperative that folks may be familiar with, um, and those are consumer cooperatives, which are similar to a purchasing cooperative, um, but you may be familiar with um, grocery cooperatives, which are which are quite common, and there are efforts to start a grocery cooperative here in D.C. Um, there are also grocery cooperatives that are active in Tacoma Park and Silver Spring, um, very nearby. Um, and then, you know, if you look at con consumer cooperatives, REI is a good national example of um, how a big company that, that people shop at all the time um, is actually owned in part by the people who shop there. Um, I want to make sure we get to the, the question about agricultural cooperatives, because I, I saw that on here a couple of times. Um, and, and I will confess to everyone who is here that I grew up um, with agricultural cooperatives. I grew up on a dairy farm. And so cooperatives of producers coming together to sell their products or to buy um, at bulk um, are very common in the agricultural world across the country. Um, I, I know that I'm not sure if anyone on the on the speakers list is. That, is there anyone um, who could share some resources if someone was thinking about starting an agricultural cooperative where they might start? I'll just share the there's a co-op accelerator incubator program called Smart Co-op. We had uh, four or five um, agricultural co-ops apply this year, and I believe one was accepted in our cohort this year. So that's one place. It's not the best place. There's also co-op development centers in many states, and um, Minnesota, Indiana, Wisconsin have very powerful ones. Also, the University of, University of Wisconsin has probably the the leading institute for kind of all kinds of co-op development. So um, that'd be my recommendation: start with University of Wisconsin Center on Co-ops. I would also say go. Um, if you go to institute.coop, which is Dallas' website, and go to the resources page um, and type in agriculture co-ops, I'm sure you'll be able to pull up some, some resources. And I think everything that Felipe mentioned, uh, those, those regional uh, development centers, you look at cooperation works, um, and you should be able to find some, some resources as well. Yeah, just to add to that, another regional resource um, is the Keystone. Development Center. Um, they work with agricultural co-ops regionally, um, but I also second um, definitely the co-op development centers are a great resource. Mm -hmm. Right. I want there's a there's a question about some of the the, the legal setup and, and the formation um, that is that has come through in the chat, and, and this has to do with the cooperative business structure. So some states have um, within their LLC and corporate law a specific cooperative. Um, setting and some do not. Um, so, for example, Maryland may not. How would someone think about approaching the setup if they don't have a cooperative statute in their corporate law? Many cooperatives um, are formed as LLCs, and so it's okay to form your cooperative as an LLC. DC has a form called the Limited Cooperative Association, LCA, 
It's primarily used for housing cooperatives, but I know that the Community Grocery Cooperative, which is an emerging food cooperative east of the river, is formed as an LCA. Um, but I would um, encourage you to uh, consult um, one of the local community development law clinics to get support around entity formation and what entity choice might be the best for your cooperative business. Thank you. Um, we have another question from the chat, and it's really about um, community building and communicate uh, communication. And so the question is, are there resources that you would recommend specifically about cooperative communications, whether that's meeting facilitation, decision making, et cetera? Two that I use. Um, Slack isn't a cooperative, but it facilitates a lot of dynamic uh, workplace exchange. And, you know, when I mentioned that movement to try to organize people. Um, a couple of high profile journalists wrote about it and there was hundreds of people contributing from investment bankers to common citizens to active users on Twitter. And it created for me and the decision making platform they use is called Lumio. Lumio is a decision making software out of New Zealand. It actually is the worker co-op itself. Um, and it had tremendous power in terms of how you prepare proposals and actually facilitate things. And the one I mentioned is sociocracy is a type of decision making model. A lot of Housing co-ops use and other um, use. So a few few ideas that I've come across. Yeah, yeah. So so to, to add on to that, um, I'm actually trained and so certified in sociocracy <laughs> as a method. Um, so the, definitely when we come in contact with before. Um, but, but one program I I didn't mention at Democracy Orphans too. And again, I'm not trying to do shameless plugs. Plug, I'm actually trying to push folks towards resources. Uh, we have a school for democratic management um, that has a wide variety of different tools and trainings for folks who are either trying to set up, you know, explicit cooperative or who are trying to increase their, their proxies within their, their current organizations as far as, you know, uh, democracy and participation. So if you look up SDM or, or look up School for Democratic Management um, at DAWI and you should be able to find those tools and resources. Okay. Oh, there you go. And Melissa put in there, democraticmanagement.org. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Um, for those of you who are asking questions, um, if we've missed some of your questions in the chat, definitely please repost them. Um, otherwise, I know that um, our, our panelists definitely had some questions for each other. Um, so let them start teasing that up. But as we tease that up, I have one last question for, for the panel, um, which is starting to think about how, how hard it is, is it or how much time does it take to start up a cooperative versus converting to a cooperative? Great, great question. Let, let me start with the with the conversion with the conversion side and the conversion angle, um, and, and I'll talk kind of where the where the food or where the field has developed from very briefly. So so I know at, at some point when as we as a field came together within the workers to owners collaborative, um, the and, and kind of started talking about how co op development is done, um, depending on the size of the organization, depending how far the organization is already practicing. Uh, democratic practices internally. Some organizations are are eighty percent of the way there, and they just need to change the bylaws um, of, of the company. So, an organization like that, you know, converting their their process and their business over to cooperatives could take you know um, four months, five months to kind of get all the practices set up. For an organization that was traditionally set up very hierarchically um, or very um, authoritarian, to, to use a to use a harsh term, um, it could take longer than a year, more than a year to actually start to get those processes up and going within the organization. What we as a field have been talking about is how can we uh, make the process of converting the business over to employee owned where the own, where the, where the workers actually hold the ownership of the business. How can we do that more quickly and then build out time to actually change the culture um, of the organization. So recognizing, especially in moments like these, that's important to get the ownership of the business and workers' hands, and then actually make sure there's enough time to, to change the culture over is, is what's being discussed. And this is something that the Legacy Business Initiative and, and a lot of people in the field are, are working on. So really distinguishing ownership from culture and, and those timelines is, is key. Yeah. Anyone who wants to share, you know, a little bit about timelines if you're, if you're starting from scratch as a startup business? Any, any perspectives on that? Because they might vary. Yeah, I'll jump in, you know, having started one from scratch here, you know, it's 
I really valued the principles and community organization about relationships and self-interest and power. And I think um, by really relating to people around their self-interest, you can draw into what the collective self-interest can be and you can meet each other's self-interest more effectively by working together as a co-op. Um, the hard part is getting the effective process such that everyone actually experiences that mutual benefit. And I think that um, takes time to learn how to do as a facilitator, as an organizer, as an entrepreneur, but it's certainly possible and it's way more meaningful than I think anything else. Um, so the timeline for us, we started our collaborations informally. I was a nonprofit um, in 2011, um, 2012. We, ex we actually got some revenue from the collaborations we did together in electricity purchasing. Then in 2013, we said, okay, we might have the makings of a co-op. We had somebody named Paul Hazen, who's uh, very active in the local stakeholder arena, former head of the National Co-op Association. He said, you guys have a co-op here. And he really encouraged us and helped us find a person to do a feasibility kind of business plan for a co-op. And then from that process, we were able to actually formally incorporate as a co-op in 2014. So it was definitely a year or two of collaborations, you know, probably th six to 12 months of business planning, feasibility study, and getting people to re ready to make their membership investments, then making those investments in 2014 and, you know, off to the races and getting revenue in 2015 and gradually growing from there. But it's, I think it's any small business has the grit and persistence to make it happen. And it's no different for co-ops, just a different structure. Uh, but I think it's anybody who's capable of starting a business can start a co-op. So we have a, another question um, from from the group, and so I'll make sure that I, I bring that up. Um, Alicia Burke asks, um, where do co-op co-ops operate from, and are there ways for co-ops to acquire space to operate? Great question, and uh, my response to that is, is kind of the first thing to remember is that at the from the outside, a, a co-op is looks like any other business. They produce a product or a service that serves a market need. They sell that product or service, and hopefully they make more money than it costs to produce that product or service. And, and so from, from that sense, um, you know, if, you're, if, it's a, uh, if you're producing a widget, you're going to operate from a manufacturing facility like any other business. If you're a tech, you know, if you're a, a, a platform co-op, which is kind of one of the, the terms that are being used around the new tech co-op, then you could have a remote workforce that's spread everywhere and everybody's coding or doing what they need to do. So it, it all depends on, on what the business model is. Um, and you have just the same amount of requirement for space or, or not for space as, um, as any other business. Okay, thank you for that. So I definitely want to open it up for a little bit of time for our panelists to ask each other some questions as they're, as they're looking at some of the different conversations that we've had today. I have a question um, for Felipe. Um, so Wake If runs an accelerator program um, called Ascend, and we work with a lot of CBEs. And I know an issue that many CBEs have is scale. So, um, you know, especially when they want to begin to access larger contracts or some of the shared contracts that you all are doing, what advice would you have for a smaller um, vendor or a small CBE so that they can Build the capacity to be able to access, you know, what you all are doing. Can I just jump in really quick, really quick and define CBE um, just for anyone who might be watching this later. So certified business enterprise is a program through the Department of Small and Local Business Development for businesses that are truly headquartered here in the district. Um, they can receive certification that is free um, and preference points on DC government contracts. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Really good question. I think my advice to entrepreneurs in that situation is get to know your customers more than just a customer, because more than likely, whoever you're serving will know other people and can get reference to those circles. And I think, um, for example, I'll tell the story of BJ, runs one of our security companies, Securmity. Um, he had worked at Allied Universal, the big national one. He had been the head of security for the World Bank for many years. He knew he wanted to go out on his own, and he he started. And I think for nine years, he talks about his struggles to try to get exactly what you're talking about from a few small contracts to some bigger contracts and bigger contracts. Um, it wasn't until we heard of security from one of our members and he said, you know, BJ actually has served us far and above. He's more professional than other we worked with and realized, wow, he just wasn't, he was, he, he wasn't for lack of pounding the pavement. He was calling everybody. He was trying to get in, but because of just the way networks work, he was calling cold calls and it wasn't through existing social networks. So it's trying to tap into who you are, might already be in relationship with and who might they have relationship with. And I think as, as a person of white privilege, you know, 
we have to be proactively reaching out and extending our networks to others to be able to proactively um, be anti-racist and who we're working with and relating with. And I think until more people uh, with skin privilege, like I do, are actively building new relationships, we're not going to kind of overcome that. But as a small business entrepreneur, leverage people you know in your network that can open those doors and try to find social networks that can kind of be very effective for connecting you to somebody else and ask for those references. Um, I think the hardest part is getting over the shame of asking. Um, and I think being able to say, can you just introduce me to somebody else? Get me that first meeting. And so many entrepreneurs I meet after that first meeting, you're like, wow, that person has it, you know, and you can see it in their face. And I think um, getting over that hump to that first 10,000 or 100,000 or $150,000 contract makes such a big deal and open up new doors from there. That's a really excellent point. I also just wanted to point out on the topic of CBEs, there's another local program um, through the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development, CNHED. They have a DC anchor partnership. And so they help um, CBEs owned by entrepreneurs of color get contracts with hospitals and other anchor institutions in DC. So if you're thinking about, you know, approaching the Community Purchasing Alliance, you may also want to look into that program as well. Great. Do our Kate, yeah. I hate to interject. Just there, there is an a important form of cooperative which um, has been left out of the, the discussion. And I, oh, see no. that, uh, my I see that my friend Ron Hans is on the call. Um, and again, Ron Hans exists across the world of cooperatives, but we didn't talk at all about housing cooperatives, which are very, very important um, to the cooperative ecosystem. Credit unions are, are also, many may not know, a part of the cooperative ecosystem, but seeing Ron on the line, definitely wanted to mention housing co-ops. And DC is, is um, one of the cities in, in the U.S. that has one of the largest stocks of uh, housing cooperatives. Um, so definitely important for them here in the city. Yeah. Um, when one of our, our panelists, and, and I'm thinking Jennifer, but someone else can jump in, um, you know, as we talk about that rich history of cooperatives in D.C., Jennifer, do you have anything to share about, um, you know, sort of the role that, that housing cooperatives have played in that? Yeah, definitely. And I guess I'll just start with contemporary and, and work backwards. Um, the Limited Equity Housing Cooperative Task Force has been doing a lot of great work to um, encourage the city to help expand the housing stock, the cooperative, um, the stock of limited equity housing cooperatives in the city. Um, and so you can check out, they drafted recommendations and presented them to council member Anita Bonds, and she's been um, really supportive of limited equity housing cooperatives in the city. Um, but going back um, at DC Co-op Day in 2019, we had Professor Amanda Hura from UDC um, talk a little bit about housing cooperative history, and she's really an expert on that topic. She also, um, Wrote a really great book on DC housing cooperatives. And of course, as soon as I say it, the name of the book slips my mind, but I'll find it and post it in the chat box. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, housing cooperatives, there have been multiple waves of gentrification in DC. And a previous wave of gentrification that happened in the 1970s really spurred the development of housing cooperatives in DC. Um, and folks organized and pushed and demanded the development of um, the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, TOPA. And that policy really enabled the, the expansion of housing cooperatives in DC. And so, you know, we've talked about, and Felipe has mentioned community organizing, but, you know, community organizing and the cooperative movement are inextricably linked, and they always have been. And going back to previous crises, because cooperatives do tend to thrive and emerge in time of crises. But, you know, during the Great Depression, that's when we saw the emergence of Nanny Helen Burroughs and the cooperative industries of DC and Northeast. It really grew out of the necessity um, and that the Great Depression kind of placed people in to create their own work and to be able to feed and you know take care of themselves and so i think that throughout history whether it be the great depression or the civil rights movement or waves of gentrification we see cooperatives emerging and we see dc being one of those places where they really do um, emerge and thrive thank you for that 
I think that's really helpful. Um, I know we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, and so I want to see if, if our panelists just have some some closing thoughts in these last last couple of minutes. Um, I know we've covered a, a lot of ground, but if you had one key takeaway for folks who are either on the line today or maybe watching this later, you know, as they think about cooperatives, what is a, a key takeaway they should think about? Felipe, we're going the same order. <laughs> okay, um, I think the big takeaway for co-ops is we need them and you can build them. Uh, I think be audacious in how you think about what a cooperative can be. Um, I think like Todd mentioned, platform co-ops, um, Jennifer mentioned LCA as a structure, limited cooperative association, which is kind of multi-stakeholder. I think we've, co-op movement haven't used capital in different ways of ways to bring in capital partners into co-ops and do multi-stakeholder co-ops. Um, I think Todd and, and his partner, Phil, and others are brilliant at structuring different things from employee stock ownership. If you want to keep control on existing thing to, um, you know, whole range to the worker co-op. And there's a whole spectrum in between and different levels of democratic participation and control, different levels of um, ways to organize a democratic workplace. And so I think we often constrain co-ops to just the food co-op or just the housing co-op, but it's so much more and so much bigger. And so my encouragement is just to imagine how anything and everything could be cooperatively governed. Right now we're trying to rethink religious adjudicatory bodies. How could the Episcopal diocese become a co-op? How can, you know, reformed Jewish synagogues and, you know, uh, mosques everywhere become a different kind of co-op? And so instead of the hierarchical patriarchal relationships of generations and centuries past, I think we're at a moment with technology, with virtual meetings that we can see a transition to a radical, different kind of open, transparent, open source that the tech movement has moved there? How do we get co-op ownership to move there so that wealth can be built for a much broader base of people and that control and democ democracy can thrive through our economic institutions? So that'd be my, my push. <laughs> other other closing thoughts, and thank you for that. that that's why I said to leave that go first. <laughs> uh, I'll do... I want to just say ditto, agree, but but I'll um, I'll accentuate the fact that that we are at a moment in in history, even before the current crisis, we were at a moment in history where the wealth gap in this country had grown to, to levels never before seen, um, and the discontent with the same you know the same old structures of power and the same folks at the bottom and the same folks at the top, like it was it, it's coming to a to a point, and this movement of cooperative ownership is is it's existed for a lot longer than this moment but it was created for moments like these the work that the folks in the field have been doing for the last number of however many years was you know they kept it going we kept it going so that when the discontent finally got too much and we needed a better way of doing business a better way of doing the economy a better way of doing life that really aligned with with the values that a lot of our leaders proclaim but don't really live out like th this is this is it we're at a moment in time so be bold um you know you have more supports now to set up a co-op from the startup stage to the conversion stage uh, of business than you know possibly ever existed in this country's history so you know don't take it for granted utilize it um and you know there is a form of you know democratic cooperative ownership that fits for for what you're doing and the folks out there are, are we're here to help you figure it out so um thank you again for, for allowing us to be on the call today kate and yes yeah i agree with everything that's been said i just want to add you know there's lots of resources available to people that want to start grow and convert businesses to cooperative ownership so i encourage you to really um, take advantage of those resources, reach out to the organizations that are on, you know, on this call and, um, you know, the national organizations like Todd mentioned, uh, the Democracy at Work Institute's website, institute.coop, is a really, really valuable resource for all, all aspects of um, cooperative, you know, business and organizing. And so um, I also just want to say that there's money out there for cooperatives. Um, so, um, you know, you can access traditional loans, um, but there's organizations that specifically fund cooperatives like um, Capital Cooperative um, and others. And so WACIF is, is um, working towards being that for the DC community. Um, and we're, we're really excited to get some new um, capital products online that are gonna be specific to cooperatives and working with Todd and others to do that. I also wanna say if you're an early stage cooperative, 
Um, the Diverse City Fund is a great um, resource. They do grants up to $5,000, and they funded a lot of early stage cooperatives in the past, like Tight Shift Laboring Cooperative and others. And so that's a great resource um, if you're in the early stage, in addition to the DC Co-op Impact Grant, which will become um, an annual grant program. So definitely stay connected, and I, I hope I look forward to connecting with those of you that are um, on the call today. I know we are we are um, at our time, so I want to say thank you to our panelists for so many resources, so much information, um, and so much energy um, towards this idea. And I also want to say thank you to everyone who's been participating on the line today, listening, asking questions, and, and sharing additional resources after that. If you are interested in getting in contact with someone from today and didn't catch their contact information, you can feel free to reach out to us at dslbd at inno.ed at dc.gov. It's the Innovation and Equitable development team. Uh, so feel free to reach out if you want any more information and we will be posting this recording later along with a slide deck that has a lot of these resources. Thank you so much everyone and have a great day.